Well, good morning, church family. How are you? You good? All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Also, while you're turning there, I need everyone to grab a response pad. They are in the pews in front of you. I'm going to start doing something unique. This is a spot for you to take notes, but at the very top, okay, uh, at the very top is a response, all right? The, The whole sermon, we're going to circle back around to this at the end. I'm going to give you three minutes at the conclusion of today's sermon, okay? And I'm just going to ask you the question, what does God want you to do Now that you've heard his word, right? How are you going to respond to God's word? I'm going to give you three minutes at the end of today's sermon. I'm going to make this our pattern moving forward. Just pull this out. You're going to write out just kind of your response to the Lord. Okay, in Acts chapter 11 um, is actually a recap of what happened in Acts chapter 10. If you recall, Okay, Peter received a vision from God and was told to go. He had a special, that some, some men were going to come and, and take him, go to Caesarea because there was a man named Cornelius. He was an Italian army commander, okay? And Peter goes to Cornelius' house and preaches the gospel, all right? In a sermon that's similar to Pentecost, And during that sermon, the Holy Spirit of God fell. Right there in Cornelius' house, among the Gentiles, the same as he did at Pentecost. And chapter 10 ends with verse 48, and it says, And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And they asked Peter to stay on and all of his friends for several days. Now, many of you were, might have been traveling during spring break. Uh, we divided chapter 10 into two sections, and Garrett and Daniel did a phenomenal job working through that chapter. But there were so many important details that it was impossible to give enough time to everything that needed it. Well, lucky for us, chapter 11 here, the first 18 verses, recaps that story. Here's why. Think about this. In the the middle of the gospel of Acts, all of chapter 10 and the first half of chapter 11, Luke sets aside to tell and then to retell the story of the Holy Spirit falling upon the Gentiles. It's so important that, that it takes up a huge, huge chunk of the narrative. And it's important for us, for you and I this morning, to refocus our heart and our mind on what God says. So will you pray with me as we get started? Our Heavenly Father, you are good. You are good to us. And you have given us your word. And you meet with us, your people, when we gather together in your name. And we sing your praises And we pray to you. We know that right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before your throne. And right now, Father, we ask you to teach us. We even welcome your Holy Spirit to convict us, show us where we fall short. Because, Father, when you convict us, you heal us. And you equip us, you give us the power to walk out in newness of life. And we believe that and we welcome, we invite you, we beg for you to move amongst us, for you to open our eyes further, allow us to see even more the goodness, the greatness of the gospel, that you have saved us and that you deeply desire to save others. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, something that we only had time to to mention as we went through the narrative uh, the the first time, that was to look at the narrative from Cornelius' perspective. Now, and rightfully so, we we followed Peter's journey, 
because he got the vision first and then he went to Cornelius' house. But this story is equally magnificent. Whenever we focus, just think about it in this first portion of the sermon from Cornelius' perspective. In chapter 10, verse 1, we're introduced to Cornelius. He is a Roman centurion. Centurion means he's a commander of a hundred. And he's living in Caesarea as the story opens. And we are simply told that he feared God. He's favorable and, and drawn to the Jewish people. He is drawn to the one true God. He even enters into prayer, praying to God. But we must understand that his culture, okay, the Roman culture is polytheistic, okay? And Cornelius is somewhere in between, right? He's being pulled by the Spirit. The Spirit is working on him and drawing his heart to the one true God. As Garrett told us, right, the one who looks further away from God is actually nearer to God than the Pharisees. But remember, guys, he's still lost, uneducated in religious practice, right? After receiving a vision from an angel to call for Peter, when Peter shows up, Cornelius falls prostrate and worships Peter, as Romans would a, a demigod, this story is messy. It's raw. But you know what Cornelius does right? Look at verse 24. Now Cornelius was waiting for them. All right, so he's waiting for Peter to return. And this is in chapter 10. In case I've lost you, sorry. Now Cornelius was waiting for Peter to return and he called together his relatives and close friends. So after having a vision, waiting on uh, Peter to, and, and those guys to come, he has gathered up his parents, his in-laws, the kids, his nieces and nephews, his military buddies, his close neighbors, everyone that he was close to. They are waiting for Peter and the message whenever he got there. Picture the scene. Because it's not just Cornelius. It's his entire relationship network. So that when salvation comes, when the spirit falls, he falls on everyone there. This is actually a repeated pattern in scripture, and it's a very big deal. Think back with me to Noah's ark. Noah is building this ark and it's never rained. And then Noah is given the instruction that he is to invite and to get everyone who's willing and wants everyone who's close to him, get in the ark. Or even at Passover. Yeah, I didn't know Egyptians could get in the house at Passover. Yes, yes, right. If they're seeing the plagues and they're like, I, I want to be saved, get in, right? Get in the house. Or Rahab, put out this, this red uh, scarlet cord and tell everyone, everyone you know, get in. And whoever is in there when we come will be saved. And so here Cornelius Right, salvation is at hand. And he gathers his entire relational network. Now, why is this important for you and for me? Because your first mission field, as we talk about the gospel going out, our call to the ends of the earth, your first mission field is to those that God has placed you in relationship with those closest to you. Those are the ones that you have the most influence over. All right, well, when we think of mission field, our minds immediately go to, to other cultures, to going to foreign lands. But our first mission field is to those that we're closest to. Not everyone is called to cross-cultural missions. I mean, yes, we are called to it as a church, but we play different roles, right? Some send and others go. 
But every one of us has a primary first mission field, and that is your relationship network. And one of the most powerful tools that God has given you is your home. In Mark chapter one, after Peter gets called as a disciple, you know what Peter does? He invites Jesus to his house. And then at the end of that day, the entire community is showing up at Peter's door because they want to meet Jesus too. Everyone that Peter knew because because of Peter's connection and his relationship all brought together. One of the most powerful tools that you have to reach your primary mission field is your home. Inviting someone into your space and serving them. Showing them hospitality. Serving a meal. Because it gives them dignity and respect. It shows that you care. As we've moved towards Easter, last week we rolled out our witness boxes. And this is a box because we have an ask as a church, knowing that our culture is open to an invite from Christians to go to church on Easter. We have an ask that you would pray for three people, that you would try and share the gospel with two, and that you would have one person, one couple, one family in your home just to have a meal with them. And this box is a, is a toolkit for that. It has inside of it a $25 HEB card along with some helps, some conversation steers. And if some of this makes you nervous, okay, I get that. Chad did an incredible training on this on Wednesday, and that video is posted on our website. It's a recording. It's a help for you. And immediately following this service, these boxes are available in the plaza. Why are we doing this? Why are we going to such great lengths as a church to to equip you and to challenge you and to charge you? It's because of this text right here, right? Because... Because making Jesus known to those that God has put within our sphere of influence is so incredibly important. And so often, if we're not intentional, we can just allow the days and the weeks and the years to pass by and to never make Jesus a priority. Remember, It is the Holy Spirit of God who moves and works and saves. But we want you to be a light in that relationship so that if someone is looking to find faith, they will come to you. After the Holy Spirit falls, Cornelius asked Peter and his six friends, all seven of them, okay, you've got to stay Right? You can imagine with what the, the kind of fervor that he said, you guys stay. Picture the scene. The Holy Spirit of God has fallen on, the, on that entire household, all that relationship ne- network, right? Afterwards, they can't just be like, well, see you later. No, it's like stay and teach and eat and celebrate and let's worship together. So including Peter, there's seven. And so they had to spread out amongst Cornelius' family and friends, and then they would meet back up. Now, certainly the hosts are serving their finest meals, the best hospitality. I mean, how would you have treated those who brought the good news of Jesus? What an amazing, inspirational scene. And I pray it, gives, it inspires you to imagine what could God begin to do in your home. Now, Peter, afterwards, let's say he stayed a a week or two weeks, okay? It it just says he, he stayed there a few or several days. He heads back to Jerusalem. Now, the news has already spread all through Judea, okay, that the Gentiles got saved. But once in Jerusalem... Peter is not met with a welcoming party. 
Instead, he's immediately met with opposition from other Jewish Christians. Chapter 11, verse 2. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you entered the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? That phrase right there, took issue with, comes from a strong Greek verb that means to separate or to judge, okay? When they met with him, they are ready with argument and with force. They are like, how dare you? Remember, they're saying this to Peter, the leader of the 12th. Now, in fairness, you and I need to see how radical this is, how culture shattering it is. We also need to remember that that none of them have had a vision from God. They are where Peter was before he got the vision. And recall that Peter had that vision three times. And he told Jesus, by no means, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And all they get is the story that Peter has gone into the home of Gentiles, where everything is unclean, and has stayed there for several days, eating with them, eating their unclean food. And none of it makes sense. It's important for you and I to remember that the Jews had a system for Gentiles to convert. The word for it was a proselyte, okay? And and it entirely involved the temple in Jerusalem. Come to the temple where God is, okay? And everything is clean, okay? And, And do everything as God has commanded. And then you can become a convert. You will always be a second-class citizen. And even within the Jewish Christian church, right, the early church, they don't know yet. They don't know. Recall the context of way back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, our thesis, right? And you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, okay? And you will be my witnesses and in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. That context of our thesis verse, you, you know what the disciples said right before that? Uh, Jesus is, is now when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel, They are imagining that that they will reign in Jerusalem and that all people will come to them. Yes, Gentiles coming and getting saved, but they are flooding in, coming in on their turf. It's why the gospel remains in Jerusalem until there's intense persecution and that bubble is burst, until the early church is forced to flee, until God's hand moved them out. And then as we've seen, as we walk through Acts, that yes, the gospel goes to Samaritans, which by the way, it stretches the early church, but the Samaritans, I mean, they still believed in the first five books of the Bible. They were still awaiting the coming Messiah. Yeah, they were half-breeds, but but they still had common ground. And contextually, we see the gospel spreading and going throughout all of Israel, reclaiming the land, and even going to the defective, to the eunuch. But now, Peter is called to the hated city of Caesarea, which, by the way, is almost completely Roman and Gentile, into the house of the Roman oppressor, into unclean space. Not coming to Jerusalem, where everything's clean and just as God had prescribed it, into unclean space. Can can the gospel go there? You must understand that the book of Acts is the unfolding of the gospel. Naturally, the disciples, they they applied it to their own lives. 
They applied it to themselves. Jesus died on the cross to forgive my sin. The disciples get that. But the book of Acts is also peeling back layers for us. These awakening moments. Oh, the gospel is for them too? The gospel goes there? Does God intend for the gospel of Jesus Christ to meet people, all people, wherever they are, as unclean as they are? And Peter begins to respond to their questions by unfolding. God did this. God showed me. In verse 5, he says, guys, I was in Joppa praying, and God gave me a vision. Okay? God's the one who came and interacted with me, a vision, and this sheet was being lowered, and on it were all kinds of animals. There were clean and unclean animals. And look at verse 7. It says, I also heard a voice say to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said... By no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth, right? As Peter is recounting this, he's telling all of his boys, guys, I responded the same way you would have responded. I said, by no means, Jesus, I don't do that. I'm a Jew, all right? You have separated your holy people from other people. Verse 9, but a voice came from heaven and answered a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And as Daniel and Garrett highlighted, Peter does not yet know the extent. He's learning. He's obedient to go, but he doesn't see it all. All of this is for his learning. And then as you walk through his recap of everything that took place, what you realize is that Peter repeatedly basically says, God did this. God did this. In verse 12, the Holy Spirit told me to go with them without misgiving. And so all seven of them went. Then listen to 15 through 18. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how how Jesus used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift that he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I? Okay, that, to stand in God's way. And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Amen. And the layers of the gospel unfold. You, You mean the gospel intends to go into all spaces, even unclean spaces? Yes, just like Jesus. Do you remember what happened when when in the gospels, anything, Jesus encountered anything unclean? You remember what happened? It became clean when it touched Jesus. Okay, various skin disease or blood discharge, even the dead. When Jesus touches the dead, raised to life. If anyone else touched anything unclean, it made them unclean, not Jesus. He brings life. He makes all things clean. And as Daniel so powerfully taught us last week, only the blood of Jesus can clean you before a holy God. And every other thing that has come before, do not taste or touch or wear this or wash like that, all of that was pointing to the need for real, permanent cleansing power. Therefore, no longer separate or pretend that any other thing is going to make you clean. Only the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So where does that leave us this morning? As we watch the gospel unfold, right, goes to the Samaritans, goes goes to the eunuch, goes to Paul, the self-righteous, goes goes now to the Gentiles. As we watch the layers of the gospel unfold, we see, I pray that this stirs up in your heart and your mind that the good news of Jesus is for anyone, anywhere, anytime, and that no space is too dirty or too unclean, and no one is too far gone for Jesus' cleansing power. Sometimes, guys, we get so comfortable because it's such a simple truth that we forget to marvel at it. Do you remember last week, Daniel told us an incredible story about leading a a foul-mouthed ex-convict to the Lord in a dugout after a softball game. Remember, salvation is from the Lord. It means that the Holy Spirit of God must come and do a work in man's heart, must open their eyes to the truth of who Jesus is, and in that moment of faith, indwell them permanently, making them a new creation for all of eternity. That's what occurs. You mean that can occur in a dugout on a softball field? Yes. Even there. And last summer, Mike Kenshin and I went into a prison in Uganda where Mike gave his testimony and preached the good news of Jesus and offered it. And seven men responded right there getting saved because even there the gospel goes. I know of a music teacher who introduces uh, kids to Christian songs and in telling them the history of the song, she weaves in the gospel as they listen intently because even there the gospel goes. Last week, a member told me a testimony of leading his father to the Lord on his deathbed. And just hours after accepting Christ, his father slipped into eternity because even there the gospel goes. To the cursed thief on the cross or a soldier cowering in a foxhole on the battlefield. You say, what about the drunkard who cries out in the filth of his hotel room surrounded by vomit and bottles and trash? Yes, there. Even there, In fact, God has ordained it from the foundation of the world that the gospel goes there. Guys, this is what Jesus meant whenever he said, you will be my witnesses even to the ends of the earth. When Jesus said that, what what sort of facial expression do you think he, he had whenever he said that to the disciples? You will be my witnesses, even to the ends of the earth. I imagine it, it's something like, you don't quite yet understand, but there's this twinkle in his eye because it's going to be awesome. This is God's plan. God's heartbeat, God's movement. As Romans 10, 13 says, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him if they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? without someone to tell them. And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news 
of good things. Even if it's feet that just walk across the street or walk to pick up a phone to make an invite. One of the major tragedies of the Titanic was the lifeboats that are designed to save people from a sinking ship were only half full. You see, people who had made it to safety did not want to turn around and go pick up those who were dying. They didn't want to risk the, the, the panicked people flipping over their boat. 700 people didn't have to die, but they did. Because the folks who were saved didn't want to go back because it was too risky. Sharing the gospel has risks. The risk of rejection, the risk of being made fun of, the risk of being called holier than thou, the risk of being avoided, the risk of being asked questions that you don't quite know the answer to. Yes, there are risks. But when someone is dying, offering them the gift of salvation it's worth the risk. John Harper was an evangelist who uh, aborted the Titanic with his, his daughter and his niece. And, and he was on his way. He had been asked back to Moody Church and he was going to preach a revival. Harper got his daughter and niece on a lifeboat and, and told them, I'll, I'll get the next boat that's coming to save us. It'll be here soon. Now, the rest of Harper's story, we know from a young Scotsman who stood up one evening in a prayer meeting in Ontario. And he explained that he had been on the Titanic and was floating on a piece of debris when suddenly a wave brought him near to John Harper, who too was floating upon a piece of wood. And Harper called out to him and said, man, are you saved? To which he replied, no, no, I am not. Well, then believe on Jesus Christ and you, you can be saved. The waves took them apart. But an hour later, he came near to Harper again. And Harper asked him, hey, are you now saved? And he said, no, sir, I am not. And again, he said, well, just believe on Jesus Christ and you can be saved. And shortly thereafter, Harper's grip upon his piece of wood slipped and he sank. As he told this story that night in Ontario, tears were streaming down his face as he recounted that there alone in the night, with two miles of water beneath him, he had trusted in Christ Jesus as his savior and that he was John Harper's last convert. At the beginning of the sermon, I told you to pull out a response pad. Turn your attention to it. I'm going to give you the next three minutes to just spend some time. You have heard God's word, and you must respond. I'm not asking you if, if I've charged you enough or... I've made you feel guilty in any twist or turn. I'm asking you, what is the Spirit of God saying to you and what are you going to do different in response to God's Word?
Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you, eternally grateful for your Son and for those who brought the good news to us so that we could know you, so that we could be saved. Thank you, Jesus, for the joy and the light that you have in making us your own. We long to walk worthy of you. We long to be used by you as your hands and your feet wherever you would use us. Give us the courage, the strength, the boldness. Equip us, kindle a flame in us that does not die down. Because while there is still time and while it is still called today, you are patiently calling all to yourself. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So at this time, the praise team is going to come and lead us in a final song. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you want to take, maybe you wrote out a prayer on your response card. You want to take that, you want to fold it, you want to leave it on the altar. Maybe you want to tear that off and keep it with you all week as you remember, right, walking out in faithfulness. If you are here this morning and you have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, as John Harper, men, women, are you saved? Come. Come. Today is the day of salvation. All you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and believe in his finished work on the cross. And you too can be saved for all of eternity. I would want nothing more than to be able to explain that to you in depth. So during this time of response, now it is your chance. Maybe you need to finish working on your card. That's fine. Or maybe you stand to your feet and you sing with full vigor and energy and give praise back to your king.